I'm very happy to present our next speaker, Dr. Michal Tenenbaum from Tel Aviv University. Dr. Tenenbaum is the head of the program for multilingual education at the School of Education. And she'll be talking about the role of emotions in multilingual education <laughs> policy. Hey, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me, Sharon and Karmit. And, uh, it's very interesting. I uh, just arrived in the middle. Sorry, but it was amazing. Um, I will talk about a very specific angle related to language policy, and I'll try to convince the convinced about the importance of emotions. Um, presenting this also on behalf of my colleague, Professor Ilana Shohami, who apologizes for not being able to take part in this um, on this day. Um, so um, I'll start with presenting my um, basic assumption about all the things uh, that are related to this multilingual education policy, which I will actually end this talk with. So the policy will only come towards the end. But the, the basic, um, a very basic assumption is the, the link, actually it will be easier, yeah, I can stand here? Because then I see my uh, uh, the links between immigration, emotions, and language, and uh, I'm focusing here on L1. And of course, there are various meeting points between these very big uh, circles. And the the main thing that I want to emphasize today is. What is the meaning of L1? What is the meaning of first language? And I view it as related. And, I'm, and, and now I'm talking, focusing mainly on immigrants. Um, so when we talk about immigrants and about multilingualism in the context of immigrants, so their L1, their first language, is naturally related to the past, related to their childhood, related to early object relations, many psychologists write about it, psychoanalysts write about it, so they use all those nice phrases of object relations, but it is related to very significant early um, emotional relations. Uh, relates to homeland. And on the other hand, we have L2. L2 is naturally related to the new place, to later adult relationships that people form later in life relates to the present, relate to the future, and in many senses there is a split between these two worlds, two like languages with this aura around them. And so I, I want to like uh, say a few, few more things about the language. Just to clarify clearly when immigrants come to a new place, they need to acquire the new language. This is not the, the topic. L2 is important, is necessary for adjustment. But the focus is on viewing L1. And if we agree on this relationship between L1 and all this early emotional childhood, memories, homeland, etc., so L1 is very, very uh, closely associated with identity, with sense of self as related to homeland, to, to the first years, to the first stages of development. And what I want to emphasize now is that when we talk about becoming bio multilingual, we of course acknowledge that it is good and there are people here sitting from cognitive and neuroscience and uh, uh, we address bio multilingualism from various directions and we acknowledge that it's very good and important. There are many advantages embedded in it, but in this, concept, in this context, what I want to emphasize is the advantages, advantages of bilingualism as a consequence of language maintenance and the emotional um, um, uh, advantages that are also associated with it. So my point here is that all L1s are created equal, and I'm emphasizing this because when we talk about Multiling multilingualism, and I'll finish my talk today with a multilingual education policy that we promote, it is very 
very um, we, we see it very often and it's not only in Israel that bi and multilingualism are welcome when we talk about um, acquiring these nice prestigious languages so it's good to be bilingual when we acquire English and maybe also French and German but when we are bilingual due to uh, uh, um, being speakers of Tigrinya for example and then we need to acquire, and this is what I start this slide with, we need to acquire Hebrew for sure. So these Tigrinian speakers are also bilinguals, and their bilingualism is just the same in terms of all these advantages, cognitive, academic, social, emotional, it's the same. So this is very, very important for me to establish. We talk about bimultilingualism as a very um, uh, that, uh, as something that uh, encompasses many advantages and it doesn't matter what kind of bio multilingualism we talk about. Um, so research shows us various, um, gives us various um, support um, for the, for the um, um, emotional, extra emotional loading of L1. Um, we have, um, I mentioned before psychologists, so psychologists like to write about the emotions and how L1 is uh, very much, we are very much attached to it and I mentioned the psychoanalysts write about it and so on, but whenever I want to really prove my point I bring some, uh, this is why I brought this illustration, when I, I can bring some hardcore data. We have also neuropsychological um, 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 studies that point to the um, the, the fact that L1 is more emotionally loaded, that when we are exposed to things that are said in our L1, we, we react more emotionally, we are more tuned to things that are said in our L1 in terms of what are the emotions that are stated, we have more elaborated memories in L1 than in, when we have to retell things that happen to us. We, we are more detailed in L1, etc. And we have uh, a lot of evidence, like from, uh, um, you know, sweat level, eye movement, uh, even functional MRI now showing that there is a greater emotionality. Doesn't mean, I'll just add in parenthesis, that it's necessarily good emotions or nice memories. It's not about that at all. It's just that it is more emotional. Um, and uh, w when we compare it to languages that we acquired later in life, and this was mainly found with regard to um, taboo words, we all know that, it's very easy for us to say horrible swears in a language that, uh, that uh, swears that contain taboo words, and I will not give examples, but it's very easy for us to, to say really obscene words in a different language and to hear them, it goes like this, doesn't touch us, but in our first language it's very, very difficult. Um, expressions of love, uh, and this has, uh, this is very, very significant when we talk about emotional interactions. So what is more emotional and more intimate and requires more emotional um, expressions than the family? So what I want to clarify is that given all of these ideas, um, not maintaining one's language may have um, um, serious implications for what is going on within the family relation and overall might affect the general well-being of the person. It is related to um, uh, the general well-being um, in various contexts and I, sorry, one minute, and I brought and I'll show you like really briefly half a second per slide uh, all some statistical because I know statistics makes good impression so I also found it in quantitative studies so this is a study, this is my PhD long ago in Australian context, Chinese families, and I looked into relationship between various emotional aspects, including attachment, family relations, family cohesion, and found 
significant correlations with language use, language preference among children and also among parents. This was done a few years later with a student of mine here in Tel Aviv about uh, Russian immigrants. Also, we found indications for significant correlations with attachment relation, which is a, okay, one way of looking into intimate emotional relationship with parents. Uh, this is part of a very large scale study I'm conducting now, finishing now uh, with um, collecting data from immigrants. First, 1.5 second generations from various places, young children, adolescents, young adults and older adults. And overall, I uh, found various very interesting correlations between, again, between um, various linguistic aspects and various emotional aspects. I mainly look, in terms of emotional aspects, I mainly look into overall well-being, self-esteem, uh, and also a range of family indices. And it was very interesting to find uh, some indices. I'm not, it's, not, it's, not, uh, over, it's not across everyone, and it's uh, less uh, among uh, some groups than others. Um, but there are very interesting indications for relationship between language indices and emotional ones. Now, I, want, I, I brought some uh, uh, specific um, findings about what is going on within the Ethiopian community, because interestingly, we found some differences between, I'll generalize, but FSU immigrants and Ethiopian immigrants. And within the Ethiopian immigrants, there were significant positive correlations between all of these, um, group identity and self-esteem. Um, uh, OK, and more and some more. And this is uh, part of also a student of mine, Belainesh McConnell, her PhD. And some regressions again. So again, it's not amazing and not uh, yeah, uh, 1.8 correlations, but that's fine when we deal with these kinds of ideas. We find in regressions some predictive factors, emotional predictive factors, mainly the family cohesion predicts positive attitudes towards language maintenance, which is very uh, impressive in my view. And I decided to bring some um, quotes from interviews because with all the respect to statistics, when we see qualitative uh, data, it tells the story somewhat more. So uh, this, these are mainly from the Ethiopian um, interviewees. Um, various uh, quotes that show how they view the relationship between language and their emotional uh, world. So for example, when I'm speaking Amharic, I'm very much connected. There are those nuances you don't have in Hebrew. When I speak to my mom in Hebrew, it, does, uh, it loses its taste. This is exactly what we know like from any other study, but um, it's like the whole mentality is lost. Um, when I miss someone, when I dream, when I talk about love, it's easy in my language. Um, but when I'm angry, I answer in, a, in other. My language is kept for the good things. Um, uh, another one, um, um, yeah, no, they're all very nice, but I know I don't have time for all of them, so I'll, I'll skip. Uh, when I'm speaking my language, it brings out my identity, my past, my mother language. It's like if she read the research. It's really using these things. About identity, uh, she talks about another interviewee, mother tongue is, uh, for me is my roots, um, where I come from uh, is who I am, the basis of my identity, um, how, she, how they feel with other Ethiopians. There is one that I really want to show you. Um, uh, yeah, I'll skip to that. I'll, I'll skip to the last one about family. This is a very nice one. Um, she says, uh, this is, a, this is a, an example of a second generation, she is in her 20s, doesn't really speak Amharic. Personally, I felt I'm missing something about not knowing Amharic. Uh, there were times I tried to learn it, I wrote words, etc., but now it's like over. My mother speaks Hebrew to me and her brothers, um, except for my grandmother. Once she asked me to fetch her socks that are under the sofa, uh, what haven't I tried? Put the boiler on, open the fridge, 
couldn't understand until my aunt arrived and told me to bring her his socks. You always need a translator. It's really a pity. Uh, so of course it's uh, it's cute, but it's not it's not about you know mere communication. It's really about emotional communication, which really misses when language is not maintained. It goes back to this idea about how language is connected with emotion and emotional um, expression. So, taken together, we see various indications for links between language, identity, emotions, family. Um, and we see uh, accumulated evidence about the centrality of L1, okay, so I'm and not saying anything about acquiring L2, it's important, that's for sure, but it's important to maintain L1 for the well-being, for the emotional purpose. It contributes to family relation, and as such, and now I'm finalizing with my policy angle, because I'm in the panel of policy, <laughs> what I want to emphasize is that this emotional aspect, these studies, is like another, um, is, a, is a factor strengthening the rationale for promoting multilingual ed uh, education policy, but emphasizing not only cognitive, social, pedagogical, and so, etc., but also the emotional angle. An emotional angle and multilingualism in the sense of maintaining one's language. Not in terms of let's teach them Chinese, which is great, but let's assist minorities to maintain their L1. So, I will now show you in four minutes our new amazing policy uh, which is a project together with Professor Ilana Shuhami, funded by the chief scientist of the Ministry of Education. And all the, everyone who knows, and Elino is sitting here, she's our head of the steering committee. Uh, and it's quite amazing that actually the ministry is encouraging the, this and is behind this and published this call and we happily uh, answered it and got it and we promote it now and we have a very nice logo um, and um, what we what we emphasize here is that a month uh, a parallel to uh, acqu acquiring a second language we encourage language maintenance we encourage um, um, uh, promoting the minority identity while applying various multilingual practices. And here I wrote like, just like, and I'm happy to talk about each one of them at length, but translanguaging and accommodation and dual language schools that you, Emila just showed, uh, multilingual awareness, um, and so on. So I'll skip this one, which relates to the shift. This is not only um, here in Israel, but there is a shift in various places around the world, mainly in Europe, but a shift from a more monolingual to a multilingual uh, ideology, and therefore also policies. I'll, I'll skip that. I'll just say a um, few more things about our new idea. We, we have in mind, uh, given the diversity in the Israeli context and the unique is challenges that the Israeli society poses, uh, the, to, to uh, develop various prototypes. It will be like a menu uh, with various ways of applying multilingual education. Common to all will be promoting multilingualism, but there are different ways. So if a school is in mixed city, in Yafo, it's one thing. In Natanya, with uh, many, many immigrants from France now, it's a different thing. In North Tel Aviv, not many immigrants, but wanting many languages to teach their children, it's a different thing, etc. So we'll have various models, all research-based, because we, pr we conduct now six different research uh, studies in many schools around the country to really promote this model, uh, this policy to be research-based. Um, and schools will choose what fits them. And this, of course, involved teachers training, uh, <laughs> like affect, uh, changing the, the, the way people think, uh, affect, uh, reaching also to, to materials, uh, ideally starting very early. You mentioned kindergartens today. So we have many, many big ideas. 
but uh, basically this is what we say. So just to summarize, uh, the advantages of multilingual education are clear, as I said, from a various uh, uh, angles, but also we should remember the emotional ones, the family, the identity, the well-being, uh, viewing language as resource, and all groups, doesn't matter, asylum seekers, Arabs in Israel, immigrants, Olim, their L1 serve the same emotional purpose for all. And we have, it's our duty to assist in uh, promoting this in our new educational policy. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Any questions, comments? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can you say perhaps something about how you measure a connection between emotions and language? I think you said something about eye tracking. Yeah, no, I don't do eye tracking. <laughs> um, there are various there are various studies that re that look into the emotional loading of languages that use also various physiological indices. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so they have the SCR for example. Okay, so they have their finger on it, and then they have uh, many, many uh, versions of it. But for example, that the, the participant is with, uh, uh, list, hears words. It can be on the level of word, can be on the level of sentences, of stories, and they measure the level of uh, sweat, or of pulse, or of uh, EEG, or whatever the index they want to see. Uh, and it's quite, uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting to see the differences between L1 and L2, but also within L1, the, the different kinds of words. So that, as I said, like you see with taboo words, it will be more than with neutral words. Or what they found, for example, is that reprimands, like, uh, reprimands, I pronounce it properly, yeah? Like, uh, I don't know, go to your room or uh, sit and think about what you did, is like much more in L1 than in later la languages later acquired because you know you don't hear this I hope when you are uh, 20 no one tells you go to your room so it's like really those phrases that are related to your childhood and again it's not that it's better that it's um, more positive emotions it's just more emotional our first years are more emotional very significant informing our cells, identity, significant early relations, etc. So, yeah. Caldwell Harris is one of, uh, did it a lot. Jean Marc Dewell does a lot of it. Pavlenko, and, yeah. Thanks very much for this. Um, we do a lot of work, you know, uh, in the trying to encourage people to maintain their, their whole language. But we find that in many cases, um, depending on, you know, which families you talk to, their desire that their child is fully integrated, you know, in the, in the community that they migrate to yes. overrides any other consideration. Right. Also because, as many other people, they think They've internalized the message that, you know, well, one language, quote, more than one language, you know, is too much. Yeah. And so, you know, they mm -hmm. want the child to be socially, linguistically, <coughs> and emotionally integrated in the, in the, in the host country, yeah. right? Um, so we find that, you know, it's not enough to send these people a leaflet or whatever. You know, sure. we really <laughs> have to go and talk to them. Right. Um, so we spend quite a lot of time, you know, going to community centers, mm -hmm. you know, and schools, and yeah. doing really a very uh, systematic. Yeah. Uh, because in many cases, they get the message, if they haven't internalized already, they get the message from the schools. Yeah. You know, that it's better to speak the the new one, the, yeah. The, the new language, yeah. Uh, so that you help your child better. Yeah. So it's it's a very common no, for sure. Thank you. It's a very very important comment, and I and I agree. And I want to s like when I say about this menu and this engaged language policy, schools choose for themselves. I also think families should choose for themselves. I'm not there to start to tell them this is good for you. And I agree that sometimes it might not be good for them. And who am I to tell them? You know, leave, uh, it's more important to, to use Tigrinya than Hebrew. I don't know, sometimes it might not be. But, 
A, we talk about you know, additive bilingualism and sometimes it's a matter of ignorance. People don't know, people think, still think, that having more languages is confusing. So this is one thing. The other thing, and that's very important, is what I mentioned, like multilingual awareness. It's doing these activities. Uh, Christine Hello was uh, visiting us uh, a few months ago and talked a lot about it. She, uh, she uh, yeah, promoted doing amazing things. And it's, the idea is promoting multilingual awareness every, for everyone. Doesn't matter if you are a minority speaker or not. And this in itself really opens the door for those less prestigious, less important languages for the kids and then for their parents. And we invite the parents and all these activities gradually might change their perceptions and they will feel more at ease with this and so on. But totally a matter of uh, training and... Uh, it's a matter of information. A lot. I totally agree. So totally. Whatever decisions they think, but at least it's based no, on... No, I, I agree. Yeah, totally. So, thumbs up, Ah. More questions? Anna? <laughs> um, I'd like to relate to this last point. I think that um, uh, what you're doing is actually quite important because they are being sponsored by the... Uh, ministry. Uh, mm -hmm. Chief scientist of the uh, Ministry of Education. So, the uh, perspective now is top-down not just bottom up. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of what you are talking about you know, in many places in the world is grounded in the fact that schools tend to exactly. send that message, mm -hmm. society tends to send that message, because schools tend to be centralized systems that it's much more simplistic to deal with the simple thing than with the complex thing. Yes. And this is a, a complex uh, system to, you know, to be right. dealt with. And so I think that the important thing about this is that now there will be also not, not just a <coughs> menu of possibilities for parents and schools to choose from, but there will be a dictate coming right. from. Right. Um, a message. Right. Good. If, right. If I may add, just, I, mean, I think the Ministry of Education in general is more open now to these things because uh, our study in preschools is also looking at the same questions and when we came to them in February, we were telling them what we found for low SES and high SES, for children from higher speaking background, children from Russian homes. So they were very much interested in not only how to promote Hebrew, because they realized by now the system sort of promotes Hebrew, <coughs> but how to keep the home language and home identity as well. So I think we've already had in the panel, also heard in the panel, that I mean, there is this balance and there is awareness more than it was in the past. It is good to have both languages. Yeah. And that and the ministry is open now right. for such changes. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. this is very interesting and very promising. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and they should take some of the methods that Mila was pointing out earlier, integrate them into the policy, and then put it down. Right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as, a, as, a, as I as I add, you know, from from my experience, it's important. It's very good that you know there is now an awareness from the top, but. <laughs> Top-down measures and policies exactly. really have to meet. Oh yeah. Yes, yes. No, for and sure. If that is no, that if, if, if that connection is for missing, sure. you know, I've seen examples where you know very well-meaning policies don't work. You know, because people from bottom up don't yeah. have the right information to, to receive them, and sure. vice versa. So it's important that we really meet in the middle. Sure. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much.